All right, and we're back. Welcome to another episode of The Brown Perspective. This is your host, Romero, and I'm here with my co-host, Eduardo. ¿Cómo estamos? Buenos días, papi. <laughs> Aquí estamos. Otro sábado en cuarentena. Esta condena. We should be counting them at this point. How many? Like 10, 12? Yes, seems like it. But the country's opening up a bit more. Have you seen out in the... I saw a few bars last weekend that were open. Yeah, and I think uh, it's interesting because uh just heard the news this morning that there are estimating about 140,000 deaths by 4th of July. And then the fact that the daily infections in Florida, California, and Texas are going up. So I think for me it's interesting that I believe today or this weekend is when theaters and gyms and other places are supposed to open up, and yet the infection rate is is going up. So I don't understand why state and local governments are moving forward with opening up when infections are increasing. Yeah, well, they may not be able to afford to stay close anymore. We may get into a situation where businesses open and they take the risks instead of shutting down you let the genie out of the yeah. bottle quien sabe it's hard to say because this second wave some some people had been anticipating it but they didn't mm -hmm. anticipate the protests which that is probably going to scare people and, and they're going to point to that and say nobody anticipated these massive protests for two weeks so now we're going to have a second wave and it's going to be even worse than we thought so let's i don't they might make a case for shutting things down again but i don't know if if there's too much pressure not to also. So keep an eye on it. That's true. So what do we have lined up for today? So, man, so much to talk about. So uh, as we mentioned last episode, June is Pride Month. So we certainly send a shout out to our uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, tr transgender questioning brothers and sisters out there. And I think we want to have a, a discussion about the term Latinx. Latinx. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of good conversation to have, uh, both from my personal experience, and would love to hear your your sense of of the term and and what it means that that a lot of people are embracing it. Sounds good. Let's see. And uh, and right. sorry. And before we get going, just to remind those who are listening to us who. Follow us on Instagram or send us an email to brownperspectivenow at gmail. We love to hear from you, get some feedback, uh, some thoughts on on the topics and what, how we doing. For sure, for sure. Sounds good. I hope we don't get into any trouble with some of these topics. Uh, well, we know getting in trouble was part of... Um, Como dice el dicho, hay que portarse mal para pasarla bien. Yeah, we'll, we'll threat lightly on, on some of these. <laughs> By the way, that Latinx word is, it feels like one of those words that just snuck up on me. It's like from one day to the other, I started seeing it, seeing it everywhere. Which I'm surprised because you're Mexican. Like to me, it made sense in the Chicano Mexican context, right? Because like I feel the equis <clears throat> is tied, uh, you know, Chicano with an equis. I know that that's like an extreme I wouldn't say extreme, but I like got true, a truer version of, of Chicano because it's sort of connecting to the indigenous roots. Uh, I guess in this case the Aztec roots. But yeah, I think for me, I have to say that it did kind of. I, I was mixed about it, right? Because I I do think that, you know, that language is a, such an important part of our heritage. And at the same time, realizing that a lot of our language is very machista. So for those who may not speak Spanish, uh, when you're talking about a mixed group of people, so if you're talking about, you know, there's women or, you know, there's a group of, of, of things, there's usually the, the male uh, adjective that gets, that gets uh, used. So that's, that's the rule uh, in Spanish. So it's kind of like a patriarchy term when you think about it i'm reading here the as close as you can get to a quick summary of what it means pronounce latin x the term has emerged among younger and more progressive hispanics as well as scholars writers and civil rights advocates to express 
inclusiveness and recognize the sexual, ethnic, and racial diversity of Hispanics. Unlike Latino or Latina, the term does not refer to any specific gender. Is it also inclusive of gay people and transsexuals? Yeah, so that's that's the main thing, right? Because that's because instead of saying so, the Latino community, uh, going back to what I was just saying, so you say the Latino community, and, and that incorporates both Latinas and Latinos, um, and and I think people really found that offensive, and then with the with the those who are either queer or questioning their sexuality, they don't want to be defined, right? And I know that before there was Latinx, there was the arroba or the at sign, mm -hmm. which is, it looks like kind of like an O and an A. So it kind of captures both. But obviously there are people who maybe are, don't have a, a defined, they feel they don't have a defined sexuality. So Latinx, it seems to be more, inclusive more open to those people who identify as such but it's interesting just if you go back to that <clears throat> to that place it's interesting that you have in, in in that little paragraph you have so many things going on because you have the new term latinx then you have hispanic which is really a term that was developed by the u.s census bureau to try to define people in the united states and then you have latino which some people feel is more more accurate reflection of the mixed heritage of Latinos with uh, black and indigenous mix and and being referenced in Latin America. Yeah. Is there a human X, the all inclusive term for everyone? Well, <laughs> just kidding. Technically, yes. I'll get in trouble for saying that human X. We should just go by the X-Men. Well, oh, no, that's the, the X. Oh, are they going to rename the X-Men too? Because that's, that's sexist. It has to be the X. What would you call it? The X-Mutants? The X-Mutants, yeah. yeah. I think what's well, funny because I know that like so many brands are just going to an X now, right? So they maybe take X-Men out and they become another another thing. But yeah, so, it, you know, it's... And, and and I know you pulled up this article and there seems to be some yeah we got trouble some some trouble and I guess some people are saying that maybe is is being more more utilized by by people who are perhaps more educated or more of an elitist attempt to erase history traditional gender roles I mean that that's a little controversial because I think in my mind uh, Spanish has evolved. And, you know, and, and that's all right because we've evolved and there are words that are now part of the Spanish language that that are that were contributions by indigenous um, indigenous communities. I think there was some African influence as well. So it's just natural that that we're deciding what those little words mean to us and to to us as a collective. Yeah, you're, and as I read these two paragraphs here, there's so much here. This this is so overloaded, too, because uh, <laughs> elitist attempt to erase a history of more traditional gender roles. So are they saying that the elitist that want to... There's this perception that it's the elite that are pushing forward this agenda of inclusivity and trying to blur the lines between men and females. So then you start talking about more conservative groups that take a stand against that. So is this, is the, the the undertone that I'm getting here, is it that the conservative religious Latinos are pushing back uh, to what they see from these like more progressive young people that are trying to blur the line between a man and a woman? And is that the angle that we're seeing here? Uh, blurring yes. more traditional gender roles? Yes, and I think that's interesting because, yes, I think that's the, the gist of it because in some ways the more conservative parts of the Latino community are feeling that they're losing the cultural war. And if more people adapt Latinx is almost like, Oh, there's an acknowledgement of, of queerness in, in Latino culture and in society. Right. So there's that. And the other interesting argument is that some people have argued that is, it's a, is elitist or I'm trying to find the right word that is, that is not right that 
that we're looking to Americanize Spanish, right? We're imposing onto Spanish some of these constructs and some of these things that are really an American an American phenomenon, you know, that we're trying to kind of get away from the traditional language in order to, to I guess, accommodate a more Anglo-Saxon cultural conversation, which is interesting, right? Um, yeah. And I, I don't think it's this article mentions it, but I know it was another, a few other articles that I, that I read uh, a few, uh, a few uh, months ago. Yeah, I'm trying to think through all this to see how I feel and where I stand on it and to see if I even take a stand on, on one side or the other. <laughs> Look, eventually, all these things are probably going to disappear. And even the people that are that are trying to hold on to whatever traditional gender roles that they believe in or traditional culture, all that stuff is going to change. Mm -hmm. So it, it, part of me, in a way, part of me thinks, well, the cynic in me think, thinks, I don't really care about this because people have very little control anyway in terms of how the culture changes. Culture mm -hmm. is, is, is affected by a lot, of, a lot of factors, including the advancement of technology. Like, how's culture going to change when everyone's strapped to, to a VR and nobody's going outside and everyone's interacting with, with everyone else online? And then you, nobody knows who you are, so you can choose to be a woman, you can choose to be a man, and nobody's going to be able to know whether or not that's your real character in real life. All that stuff is going to change. And so sometimes debating these things, I, I think, well, I, we're debating a short term, like a, something that's very short term, 10, 20 years, maybe. Hmm. Uh, but I, I do acknowledge, though, that that these, these uh, trends do have... Uh, tangible effects on people so I mm -hmm. think I'd be more interested in 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 discussing that to, to because there's actual sub for me there's substance in there uh, for example does this help someone that has traditionally felt excluded or invisible or discriminated does this help them feel more proud of themselves so that they can excel and believe in themselves in school and if it helps them, then use the word, right? But if it doesn't, if, if all it does, it creates more division because now some people are going to say, no, I don't want Latinx. I want you to call me Latino or, or I want you to call me Latina. Just the same way that it is between people that want to be called Hispanic versus Latino or don't call me Latino, don't call me Hispanic, call me Chicano. Don't call me mm -hmm. any of those. Call me Mexican, right? Now we've introduced another like word that's supposed to be an umbrella for all those words, but not everyone's going to, it's going to to embrace that new term. So you're just creating another subdivision between the people. And I don't know how that plays out. Maybe eventually Latinx takes over, at mm -hmm. least in the US. Like the politics in Mexico are, are very different. Uh, and, and even within the US from state to state, it, it, it differs so much. I mean, let's, let, let me pivot a little bit to, to Pride Month because this, this, um, it, it's like an intersection with with this topic about Latinx, because like I know people in my small town in Mexico that are afraid to come out of the closet mm -hmm. because just culturally that town is not there yet. And whereas someone in the U S I know it's a hard decision to come out to your family, especially if you're Latino, especially if you're from a conservative Latino family, it's very hard to make that decision to come out. But there's a support network in the U.S. There's friends, there's social media, there's more of that. Like if you're in Mexico in a small town, forget it. You're up against the church, you're up against the community, you're up against the standard norms. And on top of that, you might actually get a physical beating. I mean, well, mm -hmm. you could, you could get, get beat here in the U.S. as well. But if, if your parents beat you, you call the cops on them and they take them. There's, there's some recourse for you. In Mexico, you get your ass whooped by your own family. And, yep. and and I'm not talking about the cities. I'm talking about small towns. So it's it's hard to say. Like I said, if, if it benefits people in the long term, then use the word. I just it's hard to say what the repercussions are going to be. Yeah, and I think in some ways, uh, Latinx or or the acknowledgement of the term Latinx. In some ways, I do see it like an acknowledgement of brown of of Black Lives Matter. 
Um, to your point, I think it does make a segment of the population, Latino population, feel acknowledged that they exist, that they are people, uh, that they're embraced. Um, so I think that it does have that. And from my perspective, uh, you know, my first reaction was like, okay, that's that's cute, right? Like, but I understood it. And again, my understanding was, oh, that's interesting. That must be something that someone in the West Coast came up with because it has an Equis, so it's probably more, you know, associated with Chicano and it makes sense, you know, it's not Latino, Latina. Folks are a little more comfortable about that. But then it, and then, and then my initial reaction was that's, you know, people can choose how they call themselves, but I, I want to continue to use Latino, Latina, because I also have pride in speaking Spanish and retaining Spanish and, and acknowledging how much, how important that language is to who I am and what it means to be, in my mind, to be a Latino in the United States and just to be able to retain that connection to our home countries. So for me is I was caught caught in between my love for the Spanish language and what it means to me and to my identity and also understanding that there's an important need for people to feel acknowledged and seen and cared for uh, because of all the discrimination that you that you talked about. And then now it's interesting to see that some brands have engaged, not only some brands, brands and other people have engaged the Latinx, right? Because it's seen as the woke term. Um, so how do you, you know, if you're going to refer to to the Latino community before it was like, oh, you need to say both Hispanic and Latino to cover your bases. So now you have to say Hispanic, Latino, and Latinx in order to make sure that you are covering all of your bases. And to your point, maybe eventually Latinx takes over. So it'll be... As I was listening to you talk about the, as you wrestle with this, trying to uh, find out if you're still comfortable with the use of the word Latinx, but what does that mean to uh, your connection to, the, you said the connection to the Spanish language and how it, you might still prefer in some cases the use of the word Latino or Latina. But I was thinking that that, that dilemma if it's called, if it could be considered a dilemma, it doesn't pose an existential, it doesn't challenge anything at that level. It's not an existential question for you. So in the sense that if Latinx, it's was, it's was coming down from this external force and we're being told that this is now the way to be progressive and inclusive to use this word for, mm -hmm. for people that were already okay with, with, uh, the, gay, transsexual, queer community, and we had no trouble accepting them. This is not such a big change for us. But think about how it must feel to be a conservative Latino who is deep into religion, whether it's Catholicism or, or, or Christianity, Protestant, to all of a sudden have this group of Latinos that are coming and telling them the way that you have classified Latinos in the past is incorrect because first of all, you don't even acknowledge for gender differences. So we want you to start using the word Latinx. And they're like, wait a minute, but there are gender differences. There's a man and there's a woman. There's no mm -hmm. in between. And, and, and who are you guys to come and tell us that, that this is how we should start now thinking, N not just using a new word, but also thinking this way. Because there's a lot of people that don't feel comfortable with blurring that line between a man and a female. And, and right, this is this gets us into the conversation of Pride Month. That, um, I mean, people for a long time had had uh, trouble coming to terms with the fact that there's gay people, lesbian mm -hmm. women and gay people. And, but at least I, I think that they, well, I, I suppose I was already blurring the line a little bit. But now it's gone even beyond that because now it's transsexual and now it's queer. It's now it's no longer even gay. So imagine how uncomfortable they feel. They thought mm -hmm. they they thought they had a problem with with gay people. Now they have everyone coming at them. Not not, not everyone, but at least this is where the the use of the term elitist comes from because they think that it's those Latinos in power, those Latinos in the elite that have the power to to drive the conversation and to set the narrative. They feel like they're the ones that are riding on BuzzFeed and 
and engaging in social media to try to push this forward and they feel uncomfortable at least you know we can acknowledge that the change is coming very fast for them and and in a way there's a group of people that are telling them they're wrong and and they i think they resent that they resent that they're being told that they're wrong whether or not they're wrong it still doesn't change the fact that they fe- that they they believe that they're correct because their, yeah. their, their book their book tells them that too the, the the bible gives them some some hints that they're correct in this and that's why they push back on on others well why do you why do you believe they feel uncomfortable well, because because it, it's challenging their entire perspective on life, right? So if you're somebody that grew up with the Bible and traditional, you have this sense of what traditional roles are, a mm-hmm. man is a, here and a woman's here. And if you don't follow that, if you start, it starts getting into the religious aspect of it and, and there being consequences for stepping outside of what God intends for humans to do. So according to them, we're here to, you're a man, then you're supposed to marry a woman, you're supposed to try to have kids, and then you're supposed to raise your kids to to follow certain certain norms, right? And if you're Catholic, you're supposed to raise your kids Catholic too. And so their entire, uh, everything that they've learned, that, they've, that they grew up with, that entire foundation is being shattered. And it, mm-hmm. it's people that are telling them, your foundation is, is wrong. You need to get rid of it and you need to start over. And it doesn't really matter what it is, to be honest. When some when people have like these deep held belie- held beliefs about anything, if an outsider comes in and tells them you're wrong, you shouldn't do this, you need to change, and we're right, that just doesn't go over very well with anyone. It's usually a gradual process. Some people as a as a result of education and as a result of of just the country changing overall maybe the kids sometimes the kids are the ones that also make the parents a little bit more progressive because the kids mm-hmm. don't believe those things so it's harder for the kids to be brainwashed with those new um norms from the parents because the culture around them is changing so it's a but it's a very gradual process and what you're seeing right here there's usually the debates the debates are happening in real time it's giving you people's knee jerk reaction it's like this visceral reaction to something it's hard. It's harder to measure the gradual change and the gradual progress that does happen eventually as a result of this. Yeah, but but the thing is, trying to unpack some of the things that you said, and I think it is about religion and sort of the gender roles that are defined through religion and by society. But I think we need to acknowledge the fact that so much of religion has been constructed by men, right? And when you think about the Catholic faith, uh, Christianity to our larger extent, when you think about the Bible, the fact that it was a bunch of men who came together who decided which books were to be part of the of the Bible and which one which ones were not. Um, so I think there's already this this unbalance um, of the of perspective and you know so much of it is missing the female perspective first of all and then to your point yes it is uncomfortable that your foundation is being challenged and i think that's one of the reasons why why i felt uncomfortable when i first heard the term or i remember one of the before latinx there was this concept of instead of saying husband or wife saying partner because you didn't want to assume the other person's sexuality, right? And so part of my reaction to that was like, and I want you to know that it's straight, so I I can want a reference to my, that I have a wife or I have a girlfriend, whatever. But then you realize that it's not just, it's not about your comfort, it's also about the other person and how, if, if similar to how we feel being oppressed by a, a white supremacist culture when there, when there's the assumption that somebody's heterosexual, right? And like, like, and, and what is it? Can me cuesta, right? Like how, how difficult is it for me just to say, oh yeah, my partner and I love to do this. And then obviously once we get to know each other, she does this, she does that. So I think that there's this, um, there's this thing about 
acknowledging that my comfort has come at the cause of the burden of another population and how do I deal with that? So I think it's similar to what we're currently wrestling with it, with white privilege and all these constructs that are the way that, that our society has been established. And, and I think the uncomfortable, uncomfortableness too with transgender or people who are gender fluid, right? Because I think that so much of society is like, you got to be black or white. You can't be you can't be in the middle, you can't be gray. And those are just like two colors. And when you think of the rainbow for pride, you, you re realize that there are a lot of rainbows and and that it's okay to have that diversity and that people feel differently um, about their sexuality as well. All right, I mean, I totally agree with that. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, not play devil's advocate, but at least I'm trying to understand the how these cultural shifts happen. And what's true about privilege is that if you have it, you don't realize you have it. So even if it's, as you mentioned earlier, if the Bible is predominantly written from a man's point of view, you know, men don't see it that way because it's a privilege that they've had for centuries. You try to take it away. Mm -hmm. Now it feels like you're taking something away. And... And that's true. Uh, you you compared it to the the cause against racism, and and yeah, there's similarities in, in that. In in that, as a human being, you have to be uh, you try you try to be aware of how your actions affect someone else, especially when it comes to race. When it comes to the issue of of gay people, transgender, queer, one of the additional layers is that people are convinced that these people are choosing to be that way. It's different than, than being born brown or black. You didn't choose that. But there's still this idea out there that people choose to be gay, that people choose to be transgender, that it's just a fad that they're going through when they turn a certain age and that they'll either get out of it or that maybe with therapy they'll get out of it. So you have that extra layer of and that feels the insensitivity because people are saying well sure i'll take your feelings into account but what if your feelings are just very whimsical and you're deciding from one day to <laughs> from one day to the other that you want to be gay should i change how i think about my like my entire foundation on my entire belief system should i change it just because you're having a phase and I, I, this isn't me talking this is this mm -hmm. is what i've heard when i talk to people because i've talked to people latinos uh, uh, white people, Asian, uh, Indian, and you know, I always hear the, un the it's a it's a very similar um, theme that I hear from them, especially those that are older and conservative and religious. And so, but yeah, from the point of view of of conservative people and people that are pushing back on this, that's how they feel. They feel like their whole belief system is under attack from from these like elitist liberals that want to impose on them their their view of the world well it's funny because uh going back to what you said like i mean yes the imposition but also the choice but i think that's that's precisely the issue right like conservatives straights have been imposing the their system on everybody else and i think what a lot of the liberation movement is about is about Hey, you know, I can love who I want. I can ch make the choices that I want. Yes, if maybe I decide to be gay or transgender, it is my choice. Maybe just temporary. That's fine. But that doesn't make me less of a person. And that doesn't make me less of uh, an American citizen and able to serve in the military or do the things that are constitutionally um, available to me because of, of who I am. So it's almost like it's creating that space for people of, okay, well, you believe in what you believe. I believe in what we believe. And they just find a way to coexist. Co -exist. So I think that's why the fact that, you know, it took so long for um, gay people to get the the right to um, to get married. And they're still fighting so much discrimination, uh, I think. I know I've heard stories of people feeling that they need to go back into the closet in order to access 
uh, services once they're older and all these things that uh, that was so fighting for. Uh, but I think, again, it's it's just a matter of trying to create the type of society and the type of policies that allow people to to be who they are and kind of like live and let live. Right. If 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 you're if, if you're comfortable in who you are and your foundation and your sexuality, that's fine. Let other people do what they need to do and don't feel because it's almost like an insecurity. Right. Like I feel that that oftentimes is like they're insecure and somehow seeing those gay people there is going to make me gay or is going to make my kid gay or something like that. So there's this constant fear that somehow you're going to be perverted uh, by by that external factor. So I think there's a lot of insecurity that comes from from that from that place, from that desire to to keep your comfort and to keep your foundation and to protect the word of God, too. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. I know people in my community, in my family that voted Republican, Mike Huckabee, based on religion alone, based based on the fact that Huckabee was the one that was speaking out against gay people, gay mm -hmm. unions. And, and that was the that was the issue back then. Yeah. And that's the that's the that's the problem that people get into when they're when they're so tied down to that when their entire belief system is based on the teachings of a 2000 year old book, <laughs> there's very little room for error there. And I, I mean, I agree with you. I, look, we're going through Twitter here. It's, it's senseless that, that you have things like this, that here's this tweet from, oh, this is Chuck Schumer. How could you have to be to announce a rollback of health protections for transgender Americans in the middle of a global pandemic? Uh, assuming that what Chuck Schumer is saying is is right, because I'm not going to believe what a politician tells me right off, uh, just without researching it. But if that's the case, then why, right? Just because because they don't feel that they fit in the traditional definition of a man or a woman, and we're going to discriminate against them. Like if we, like society uh, has has, in a way, people have said no. There's only a man and a woman. And if you're not one of those, then there's something wrong with you. And that's abnormal. As if we don't mm -hmm. have uh, infinite diversity within humans to coexist with those different variations within us. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's people that are born that half of their life, they think they're men. The other half, they think they're a woman. Uh, there's, there's just so much variation. Who is anyone to say that that's not possible, right? But but these people think, no, no we, we, we know because we've unlocked the key to genetics and we can tell you that that that's absolutely impossible. Like, at least if they made that argument, I'd find it a little more believable. But they're making the argument just based on the, the teachings of a of, of mainly religion and, and mm -hmm. whatever cultural teachings have been passed down. Uh, let's go through a few of these tweets. Uh, this is unfortunate. Another black trans woman murdered in Philly. Uh, obviously, we don't have enough time to get into the into the background of this, but it this suggests that it's a hate crime as opposed mm -hmm. to anything else that, that was going on. So that's very unfortunate. This is Happy Pride from, I'm not sure what anime this is. This is one of the younger ones. Today we remember the 49 people killed in the terrorist attacks driven by hitting the Pulse nightclub and oh yeah. yeah. So many things happen that's these fun. days that, that you forget just, just that this wasn't so long ago that it happened. This guy's for Black Black Lives Matter. Oh, this the Sims. This changed the logo to Pride Money. Why it's including more colors in the rainbow flag? Oh, interesting. That's good. The Sims as in the game? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the Sims. I used to play Sim City when I was a kid. I used mm -hmm. to love building the cities, and then I think Godzilla would come and just go through it and scorch the whole thing and destroy it. The it game of Super up. Nintendo. <laughs> Remember, if you're not supporting all the letters in LGBTQ, you don't get to wear any rainbow paraphernalia. Ah, interesting. So, and we have a little sketch Pride Month from your friendly neighborhood, dude, of the non cis variety. All of this stuff is going to get turned on, on its head when virtual when virtual reality comes on because even the people that are 
that are the biggest proponents against gay people and against transsexual, they're going to be the ones that are going to put on their virtual gear, go into a virtual world and be someone else of the different sex or someone in, in a, a non-binary role. Vas a ver. I'm going to catch all these politicians and all these religious leaders <laughs> going in there to um, try to solicit sex from um, somebody from the same sex as them. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, yeah, it's funny that you bring that because, you know, I'm not even thinking that far ahead, but I guess that's the that future is closer than than we think. Well, that might be within 20 years, even less at the way that technology is advancing. So that's why I'm telling you that a lot of the, the things that change culture is technology is is huge, huge. And so a lot of people that fight against it, they they're fight. They're, they're fighting a losing battle. The best they can do is slow it down eventually society is going to shift and all of those relics of, of um, ideas are going to be shed and we're going to move on, move to a more inclusive world. And, and it, it's good, right? Because like, honestly, you shouldn't, we, at some point in all of these terms, Latinx, Hispanic X, whatever, they're just going to go away and people are just going to call themselves American, which is, that sounds pretty good. I mean, American, but you can still have, like I said before, the, all the cultures are going to merge. We're still very close to our Latin American roots because we're just a generation away from, from, from that. A lot of us were still born in, in other countries. Like you were born in Colombia. I was born in, in, in L.A., but I was raised in Mexico. We still have a very close connection, and, and that's most of the people here. But give them four or five generations, a lot of those connections go away. <laughs> as hard as you try to retain it, 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 it changes. It blends into a, a new American culture that's, gonna, that's getting created. That's true. Um, but I think that in some ways this, even if at some point in the future, these conversations are going to be not relevant, I think it's important because they do inform the policies, the thinking, how, how things are developed, right? So I think that these conversations, you know, they do inform policy they do inform perception thinking so i think it is important to continue to to uh, for us to reflect and de deconstruct and understand all this stuff so that way we can you know welcome that future with better informed yeah I i'm still waiting for the day when we can stop arguing about this stuff and actually start opposing foreign wars <laughs> Yeah, good luck with that, buddy. Yeah, right. I think I'm I'm gonna have to to leave it at that because uh, we didn't have time to cover Antifa, anti-fascist, and Juneteenth. But can we cover those next time? Yes, we can. All right, we'll pick up on that uh, next week's episode. Thanks for tuning in once again, Eduardo. How can people reach out to us and and stay in contact? Yes, follow us on Instagram, the Brown. Brown Perspective, and also you can send us an email at brownperspectivenow at gmail.com. Fierro. Fierro. Yeah, All right, sounds good. We'll take it easy. All right, bye.